There's an ancient prophecy that's been shrouded in mystery for centuries. You probably have a copy of it or several copies in your home right now. This prophecy covers a span of nearly 2,000 years, from the time immediately following Jesus' death and resurrection all the way to our day. It concerns the church Jesus built, the disciples who followed Him. And it was recorded to give those followers encouragement and warning. If you call yourself a Christian, you need that encouragement and warning as well. So what is that prophecy? And what's the message for us? We're going to unlock that mystery today. And we're going to offer you a powerful and fascinating booklet, God's Church Through the Ages. Be sure to get a pen and paper to write down the information. I'll tell you how to order it a little later on. But now, let's unlock the mystery and together explore the secret of the seven churches. Let's go back together in time almost 2,000 years. We'll focus our attention on the area called Asia in the first century, what we refer to as Asia Minor or Turkey today. It's a time when the mighty legions of the Roman Empire exercised dominion over the vast territory surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. We'll pick up the story in the last decade of the first century. The Apostle John had been arrested for his faith put on trial, and sentenced to exile on an island out in the Aegean Sea. This is off the coast of Asia Minor with Greece off to the west. While imprisoned there on the island called Patmos, John received a marvelous vision and wrote down what he saw. It's preserved in what we call the Book of Revelation. As has been explained on this program before, the Book of Revelation was the message from Jesus Christ to tell his servants what must shortly come to pass. That's found in the opening verses. And the rest of the book contains powerful seals being opened, trumpets blown, plagues poured out, activities around God's throne, and ultimately his kingdom being set up. But there's something else, something often overlooked in the first several chapters. That is, who was the book addressed to? Let's read it together in Revelation 1 and verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Again, the Asia being spoken of here is what we call Asia Minor or Turkey. The seven churches were seven Christian congregations in seven cities on the western coast of Turkey. The cities were Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos or Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And what we find in chapters 2 and 3 are specific messages for those seven churches. The question is, who exactly were these messages intended for? The Christians living there back in John's day, or people for a later time? Or perhaps might it refer to both? If you're familiar with Bible prophecy, you understand the principle of dualism. Dualism in prophecy means there is an initial fulfillment, perhaps even in the prophet's lifetime, and then another fulfillment yet for a future time. That later fulfillment might be decades or even centuries down the road. And that's the secret of the seven churches. The messages of Revelation chapters 2 and 3 was not just for Christians living at that time. Each congregation of Asia represented successive eras of the church down through time. In this way, the messages were prophecies that would span almost 2,000 years. And the final era has a message for today. That's why this subject is so important. We're not just talking about ancient history. There's a sobering warning for our day. Welcome back. In the last segment, we discussed how the messages to the seven churches had a prophetic element intended to span two millennia, all the way to the end of the age. So what were the messages to the seven churches? We'll take them one by one. The first is the message to Ephesus, repent and do the first works. Let's start by reading in Revelation chapter 2, and verse 1. To the angel or messenger of the church of Ephesus write, 
These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. This letter was commending the first century Christians who had followed only true teachers of Christ and had rejected false apostles. But he had correction for them as well, as we read in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. The Christians of that era started off with great enthusiasm on the day of Pentecost in 31 AD. 3,000 of them were baptized. But by the second century, many were growing cold spiritually and forgetting their first love. John warned them, go back to the beginning. Do the first works. Remember where you started. Undoubtedly, some obediently heeded the warning and took heart. So that was the message to the brethren in the time period represented by the city of Ephesus. What was the next era and the next message? Number two, the message to Smyrna, be faithful unto death. Prophetically, the next letter was intended for the era represented by Smyrna. That era would comprise the third and fourth centuries. How do we know this? Let's read in Revelation 2 and verse 8. And to the angel or messenger of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. Verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The message to the church in the Smyrna era included the prediction of ten days of tribulation. But what did the ten days of tribulation mean? In the Bible, a prophetic day can refer to a one year of actual time. So a ten-day period of tribulation is most likely referring to a period of ten actual years. Is there any time when this happened in history? Yes, there is. History records a horrific persecution on Christians during the reign of Emperor Diocletian. In the year 303 AD, he enacted three very harsh laws aimed at punishing Christians who would not renounce their faith and sacrifice to the Roman gods. Here's how the situation was summed up by the writer and historian Henry Daniel Ropes in his book, The Church of the Apostles and Martyrs. Three successive edicts promulgated within a very short time increased the severity of the anti-Christian measures going so far as to revive the rule that every Christian must be ordered to sacrifice. A bloody persecution was set in motion throughout the empire. It was the last of the great persecutions, but by far the worst. This ordeal lasted nearly 10 years. Generally speaking, it was seldom the pagan mob who instigated the persecution, as in days gone by. It was now the state that struck. Churches were demolished, and Christians were punished by death for holding secret worship meetings. This was a difficult time for God's people, but Christ encouraged those who would remain faithful unto death. He promised to give them the gift of eternal life. What was the next message? Number three, the message to Pergamos, beware of compromise. The church era labeled Pergamos began around the fourth century and lasted until about 1000 AD. What happened in the fourth century in church history? It was at that time, under the Emperor Constantine, that Christianity became nominally the official religion of the whole Roman Empire. But did the empire become truly Christian? Was Constantine truly Christian? The historian Henry Daniel Ropes again describes this era as a time when the churches received 
a flood of half-converted folk, time servers, and lukewarm believers. Faith, no longer exalted by heroism and self-sacrifice, becomes half-hearted. Christianity reached this perilous turning point during the reign of Constantine. And what we find in the message to the next era reflects that same warning. Let's pick up the story in Revelation 2 and verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell where Satan's throne is. Verse 14. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Balaam was the Old Testament prophet who taught the Moabite king Balak how to trick the Israelites into disobeying God. This era of the church was also marked by people who were Christian in name, but were not obedient to the laws of God. Jesus had warned his disciples that some eventually would take the name of Christ, but water down the message. Notice what he said in his Olivet Prophecy in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. How many so-called Christian practices are just warmed over traditions of men with a Christian veneer? These ancient warnings are for us, too. So we've covered three eras, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos, the period that covered roughly the first thousand years of church history. It's a fascinating story, detailing the triumphs and traps that each of the first three eras faced. In the last segment, we covered the messages to the first three eras of God's church with the words of encouragement and words of warning. What came next? Let's talk about that now. Number four, the message to Thyatira. Come out of false Christianity. This church of Revelation 2 represented an era lasting from about 1000 AD to about 1500. This was a time when not conforming to the laws of the religious and political system could mean execution. Let's read the message. Revelation 2 and verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. The brethren of the Thyatira era were warned against succumbing to a woman named Jezebel. Jezebel in history had been the Sidonian wife of the wicked king Ahab in ancient Israel. Jezebel was guilty of inciting Ahab to worship pagan gods. But in this verse, this is a symbolic Jezebel, a Jezebel who represented a false church, which not only propagated false religion, but persecuted those who didn't fall in line. In the Middle Ages, we find remnants of Christians who held faithful to God and did not bow to the pressure of this church-state alliance. Giorgio Torn, writer of You Are My Witnesses, explained this in his book. The Waldensians claimed that the church did not completely lose its way by Constantine's poison. Despite the betrayal, a faithful remnant would survive. The church may have betrayed its Christian witness, but the light of the gospel was not extinguished outright. This was the essential theological line the Waldensians would pursue for centuries. You have to search a little bit, but with a little digging, you'll find written records of persecuted groups of Christians that were nevertheless keeping the seventh-day Sabbath, rejecting infant baptism, rejecting the adoration of the cross, 
as an emblem of worship and taking the bread and wine as a memorial of what Christ did with his disciples before his death. We've now swept through 1,500 years of church history. We've found that Christ's faithful disciples following his lead, no matter the external pressure to recant or conform to unbiblical traditions. That should give us all pause to think. How are we making our decisions now? Whom do we follow? Christ or peer pressure? The lessons are for us today, not just our brethren from centuries ago. And that brings us to the fifth prophetic era with a message. Number five, the message to Sardis. Strengthen the things that remain. Let's read on in Revelation 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. The message for the prophetic era of Sardis is pretty striking. It sounds like it's meant for a group of people who are just barely hanging on to the truth. These are small, isolated groups of people in danger of losing what they have and dying out as a people. While living in relative obscurity, from the 1600s through the 1800s, Jesus exhorted these people to stand fast. This was the message to that era. And that brings us into the modern times. Number six, message to Philadelphia. Do the work of preaching the gospel. Let's read the prophetic message for this church era in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So this prophetic era is spoken of as having an open door. That means this era had an opportunity to preach the gospel in a unique way not seen before. So what is significant about this? After operating in the shadows for about 1900 years, the church went through a door in the use of the mass media. It was the Philadelphian era of the church, and it was the beginning of the 20th century. In the early 1930s, a man named Herbert W. Armstrong began broadcasting on radio. He founded a magazine called The Plain Truth. Toward the end of the 20th century, the Plain Truth magazine was being mailed to over 200 countries around the world, reaching a circulation of over 8 million copies each month. Mr. Armstrong went on television, and The World Tomorrow at one time was aired on over 400 stations in the United States. It was an era of the church going through a figurative door, and that door hasn't closed yet. How do we know? because that work continues to this day in this very program, Tomorrow's World. Tomorrow's World is a continuation of the message which began to be broadcast way back in the 1930s. And new doors of the Internet continue to open with exciting potential to reach even more people with the gospel message. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10 says this, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. There is a reward for faithfulness to God and His word. It takes courage and strength to obey God wholeheartedly in the face of opposition. But with God's help, we can do it. With God's help, you can do it. But we haven't yet finished the story. There's one last era. What is that? Number seven, the message to Laodicea. 
a warning against lukewarmness. Let's read it together in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. What Jesus predicted is that in the time just before his return, there would be a great spiritual malaise even among his people. Many would be rich and increased with goods. They would not be concerned about having a real relationship with God. They'd be comfortable. They'd be self-satisfied and self-sufficient. And they wouldn't see they were in grave spiritual danger. Jesus explained the predominant attitude of Christians in the years before his return would be sort of lukewarm. But what does that mean? Well, they wouldn't be hot on fire for his truth, wholly dedicated in their life, making changes and growing and humbling themselves. But neither would they be entirely cold, not having God in their life at all, totally out in the world, drifting, living in sin, rejecting God and shaking their fist at God. He said that even many of his own people would be somewhere in the middle. And he's addressing those people, his people, who are drifting spiritually, not fully focused, not energized, and not fully committed in backing his work. Notice this as well. This era is typified as Christ on the outside knocking on a door. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19, and as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. So let me ask you a question. Is Christ on the outside looking in when it comes to your life? Have you come to the point in your life when you've surrendered your will? That means keeping the Ten Commandments, all of them. Getting your life straightened out. Rejecting any part of your life where you're sinning. Not just sort of coexisting with sin, thinking God understands. Yes, God understands. He understands that if we're not hot, on fire, so to speak, zealously and obediently living the truth, we shouldn't even bother calling ourselves Christian. Jesus is asking the question, who will really go all out in serving the living God? The stakes are high. Time is short. He's laid it all out. That's the question, and that's the challenge for you and me. And with God's help, we can make the right choices and be close to God and be protected as this evil age draws to a close. There's so much more about these eras that we could cover but simply don't have the time. But you can study this in greater depth at your own pace with this booklet right in front of you. It's free. It's called God's Church Through the Ages. It'll open your eyes in incredible detail to what happened to God's people, who He loved through each era of the church and how some courageously and valiantly stood for the truth and remain as examples for us today. You need this booklet to face the trials coming on our generation. Call, click, or write today. Request God's Church Through the Ages. There are mysteries in the Bible, mysteries that God will help us understand if we seek Him with all our heart. Today we've revealed the secret of the prophesied eras of the Christian church. We've seen the trials that each era endured. And we know that there are challenges Jesus Christ said our generation will face. We also are given encouraging words of affirmation that if we are obedient and faithful, we can escape the judgment that is coming on our generation. As Jesus said to each of the seven churches, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you for being with us today, and be sure to join Gerald Weston, Richard Ames, Wallace Smith, and me next time as we continue to unlock other mysteries 
in your Bible. On Tomorrow's World, we'll continue to explain the Bible's relevance to your life, your world, your family, and your future. Together, with God's help, we can navigate the challenges we face with encouragement and instruction straight from the Holy Bible. We'll see you next time.